All right, welcome folks. Uh, my name's Amal Matu. I'm a faculty member at University of Maryland School of Medicine, and we're gonna spend a little time talking about syncope, formal title for the faint of heart. Actually, this is for all of you, regardless of how your hearts feel. We're gonna spend some time talking about cardiogenic syncope. There's a lot of different things that cause syncope. We're gonna focus on the cardiac causes. Now, this actually is going to be a visual diagnosis lecture. This is an EKG lecture. Uh, I know many of you have probably heard a lot of lectures on syncope over the years, and there's been a lot of literature and research has come out which has really taught us all that we, especially in the United States, we have a tendency to admit too many patients with syncope who get negative workups, and we spend a lot of money, and those patients can probably just get outpatient workups. We know that. We've come to realize that. In terms of the workup in the emergency department, if you do a good history and physical, you really don't need, in many cases, to do much of a workup. You should let your history and physical direct you to what you need to do with the workup. If somebody, for example, is having a lot of vomiting and diarrhea, then yeah, check electrolytes. Uh, if somebody has uh, heavy periods or GI bleeding or anything like that, or, or severe weakness, of course, get a CBC and check the H&H. &H. But if they don't have things like that, routine CBC, routine electrolytes, routine cardiac enzymes, routine Holter monitoring, routine um, sending these patients for EP tests, it turns out to have a very, very low yield. Routine CAT scan of the head, incredibly low yield, unless there's something on the history or physical, physical, especially neuro exam or heart exam, unless there's something on the history or physical that tells you that you need to work them up in some way, you don't need to do much of a workup. There's no routine labs that you need to do, but with one exception, and that one exception that you should routinely do in everybody who comes in with syncope is the electrocardiogram. And so that's what we're going to focus on. What is it that you should be looking for on the electrocardiogram? Now, these are kind of the no-brainers I put up here. Everyone knows that you're going to look for cardiac ischemia or an MI or a STEMI. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. You're also going to be looking for obvious arrhythmias and AV blocks. That's kind of a no-brainer also. But there's a handful of other things that you should always be looking for. They're not every day, but if you pick them up, you're going to save a life. And that's what this lecture is really going to be all about. What are the other things that you need to look for every time you get an EKG on somebody with syncope? And you should probably, probably be doing EKGs on everybody who comes in with syncope. Now, this is 100%, but just about everybody. All right, so let's go through some cases. And all of the cases I show you are real emergency department cases. So put yourselves in the shoes of the emergency physicians that saw these patients when they come in and ask yourself, what's the diagnosis of what would you do? Case number one, this is a 29-year-old man who comes in after a syncopal episode. Now he's sitting in front of you saying, doc, I feel fine. That's the real history. I feel fine. He looks good. He's got a pretty much normal exam. His history is unremarkable. No one else in the family died. And he said that he was just doing some different things. I think he actually, in this case, he was running to catch a bus and he got palpitations, lightheaded, and then he collapsed. No trauma. His exam right now is unremarkable. And this is, again, a real case. What ended up happening, he got a bunch of labs. He got cardiac enzymes sent on him. Everything's unremarkable. He says, doc, it's getting late. I want to go home. So he ended up being discharged home and then he was exerting himself in some way a few days later and then collapsed and paramedics were called, found him in V-fib. They shocked him. They brought him into the emergency department and that is when I met him. Uh, he was in cardiac arrest. And I went back to the computer and found this EKG from his visit in the same emergency department a few days earlier. And uh, the EKG interpretation that we'll talk about in a moment was missed. I pronounced him dead. We were unable to resuscitate him, real case. And the diagnosis here is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, one of the problems here with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is most people don't learn how to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on 12 lead EKG. Even the cardiologists don't typically learn this, unless you're talking about maybe a cardiologist who teaches the courses or writes the books on EKGs. And the reason is most cardiologists learn to diagnose this on Echo, exactly, on Doppler echo. They don't learn the EKG findings, but you and I as emergency physicians, we've got to know the EKG findings. So what is it that you're looking for? It's very simple. When you see an EKG that shows high voltage, big QRS complexes with deep, narrow Q waves, right? You look up there, take a look at those Q waves, especially in the lateral leads, one AVL, a little bit in V5, V6. The most common place that you see these deep, narrow Q waves, sometimes referred to as dagger-like Q waves, deep and narrow, 
The most common place is going to be in the lateral leads, sometimes inferior, but most common in the lateral leads. When you see that in the presence of high voltage, send that patient for a Doppler echo to make the diagnosis and you'll save a life. All right. So high voltage with deep, narrow, dagger-like Q waves. And, and that's what this patient had, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The official read by cardiology later uh, uh, was LVH and possible old lateral MI. Well, why would a 29-year-old have an old lateral MI? No, these are not infarction Q waves. Infarction Q waves should be at least one box wide uh, and usually at least a third the height of the entire QRS. If we go back for a second, these are pretty big Q waves, but they're not wide enough to call infarction Q waves. These are not infarction Q waves. These are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy Q waves because they're very narrow and deep with high voltage. Here's another case. Once again, very simple visual diagnosis. Things to look for, high voltage with deep narrow cues in the lateral leads. In this case, lead one, lead AVL, lead V5 and V6. Take a look at how narrow and deep those are with the high voltage. Here's another one. High voltage, in other words, big QRS complexes and deep narrow cues. One, AVL, V5, and down there in V6 once again. Here's another example. High voltage. Now, sometimes when you get really high voltage, you can get screwed up T waves. That's the official term. Screwed up T waves in some of the leads. You know, everyone has seen LVH and that strain type of pattern. High voltage produces abnormal repolarization. So the T waves can sometimes look a little bit abnormal and a bit concerning, but we've got high voltage and take a look at those Q waves, very deep, very narrow, not much in V5 or V6, but definitely in one in AVL. Here's another example, high voltage, relatively high voltage. And in this case, there's not much in one or AVL, but when you look at V5 and V6, it's kind of bizarre looking, but very deep Q waves at the beginning of those QRS complexes. And here's another example, high voltage with deep narrow cues. Take a look at AVL, take a look at lead one, take a look at how deep and narrow those are. And sometimes you'll have flipped T waves just because the high voltage produces abnormal repolarization. Those are very nonspecific. But again, high voltage with deep narrow Q waves, in, especially in the lateral leads. If you see it in the inferior leads, you still worry but most commonly in the lateral leads. Take a look at this case. Not much in one or AVL, but take a look at those Q waves in V5 and V6. Those are like, those are more than daggers. Those are like swords. There's just nothing else in emergency cardiology that's gonna give you Q waves that look like that. So when you see the high voltage with deep narrow Q waves, send that patient for the diagnostic test of choice, the Doppler echo, and if they pick up hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you get that patient off to a cardiologist as quickly as possible in the meantime, you tell them no exertion, and if there's any delay, you put them on some beta blockers. Beta blockers are negative inotropes. No exertion and negative inotropes, beta blockers, until they see the cardiologist and get a Doppler echo. And you know what? You just save a, a young kid's life by knowing what to look for. So again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, look for high voltage and deep narrow cues, especially lateral leads. The vast majority of these are males, but we have seen some cases in women, young women as well, and your diagnostic test of choice is getting the Doppler echo, all right? So we'll let that sink in. Just take a little mental break for a second. So let's recap. What is it that you're looking for on the 12 lead of a syncope patient? You're looking for signs of ischemia. You're looking for dysrhythmias and AV blocks. We've added hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to the list of things that you always look for, okay? What else are we looking for? Case number two, 30-year-old woman comes in after a syncopal episode, and now she's sitting in front of you, like most of these patients, saying, Doc, I feel fine now. I had the syncope, I had the passing out episode. I fell out earlier, and uh, here is the 12 lead EKG. And uh, I think a, l a lot of people will get this. Uh, th this is relatively new in the EKG literature, just over the past 15, 20 years or so. And what that means is a lot of your older cardiologists may not have learned about this when they were in training. But the key findings here are in V1 and V2. You see this kind of incomplete right bundle-ish type of pattern with this strange ST elevation that's coved. Oftentimes this ST elevation like this convex upwards, sometimes it's straight like what you see in this example. Every now and then it's concave upwards, but most concerning is if it's straight or convex upwards. 
And that is, as most of you said, this is uh, the Brugada uh, pattern, the Brugada syndrome. So what is Brugada syndrome? Brugada syndrome, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but Brugada syndrome is an electrical phenomenon that was first identified probably in the late 80s, early 90s. It's become very popular in terms of the electrophysiology literature over in the recent years. And this is something that has been associated with the sudden, sometimes unexpected bouts of polymorphic VTAC. Uh, patients can unexpectedly go into polymorphic VTAC. It's not necessarily associated with exertion. In fact, sometimes it's associated with, uh, with high vagal tone, being um, asleep at nighttime or maybe after heavy meals when vagal tone is a little bit higher. So it's not an exertional type of syncope, but what happens is this is an electrical phenomenon that people believe is related to a sodium channelopathy where patients can suddenly go into polymorphic VTAC and if they're lucky, it spontaneously converts back to sinus rhythm and they wake up, right? They go into polymorphic VTAC, fall to the ground. If they're lucky, they convert, they wake up. If they're not lucky, it degenerates from polymorphic VTAC into V-fib and asystole and we call that sudden death. So you see, sudden death and syncope oftentimes are the same disease along a spectrum of how lucky you are. So when the patient comes into the emergency department after the syncopal episode, you see this, it's because they were lucky. Next time they may not be so lucky, all right? So again, there's two types, uh, over the years people have talked about two different types of Brigada syndrome, the saddle type and the cove type. On the right, the cove type is much more concerning. That's when there's that incomplete right bundle pattern with the convex or straight ST segment elevation that you see on the right side. The saddle type of elevation was first talked about 10, 15 years ago, but we now know that this is less sensitive and less specific. So the electrophysiologists get really concerned about the cove type, not as concerned about the saddle type. If you see either of these in the right setting, but especially the cove type, you get on the phone with the electrophysiologist. And I'm gonna emphasize electrophysiologists because when you talk about all the different cardiologists that are out there, you know, they all have their special areas of expertise. There's a general cardiologist, and there's the lipid cardiologist, the hypertension cardiologist, and there's the interventional cardiologist, there's the electrophysiology cardiologist. The one group of cardiologists that live for this diagnosis is the electrophysiologist. A lot of the others, we've come to realize, often don't know that much about this. So if you have access to electrophysiologists, make sure that they're the ones that you're getting on the phone with. All right, a few more examples. Here's a patient, again, similar to the other story. This is a, a patient who came in after a syncopal episode and this EKG was obtained. The formal interpretation by a general cardiologist was incomplete right bundle with ST elevation, possible MI, possible septal STEMI, but the patient was totally asymptomatic. So the emergency physician didn't know what to do with this. It, it, you know, the computer's calling this a STEMI, Consults cardiology, cardiology comes down, they say it looks like a STEMI, but the patient's asymptomatic. So tell you what, let's just admit the patient, rule them out, we'll do an echo. So the patient gets admitted, rules out, gets an echo, echo's normal. This is purely an electrical problem, it's not um, an anatomic problem. So the echo will be normal, a stress test will be normal, an MRI would probably be normal. It's only electrical, it's not anatomic, all right? It's a sodium channel problem. Uh, that's the prevailing thought. So anyway, this patient is ruling out and is getting ready to be discharged, and then someone else happened to see this EKG and said, you know, this, this kind of looks like that Brugada thing that I've heard about. And so again, totally true story. They went to Google Images, and they pulled up Google Images for this Brugada syndrome, and they found EKGs that looked exactly like this, and they said, you know what, I think this is Brugada syndrome. So they transferred this patient from the community hospital to the university, the patient went right to the EP lab, where in the EP lab, they tested him, confirmed the evidence of Brugada syndrome, and then put an AICD in. So uh, that's the part I haven't talked about. How do you confirm the diagnosis? Well, the prevailing theory is that this is a sodium channelopathy, and what happens is that they'll take them to the EP lab and the electrophysiologist will infuse a potent sodium channel blocker, typically something called agmaline, which is even more potent of a sodium channel blocker than procainamide or, or flecainide, things like that. And when they infuse this medication, one of three things happens. Number one, nothing happens, and that rules out Brugada syndrome. Number two, 
if the ST elevation becomes more pronounced, that rules in Brugada syndrome. Or number three, the patient just goes right into polymorph VTAC, at which point they just shock the patient out of it. You know, it's, it's not a big de deal for the electrophysiologist to shock people out of it because they have, they have electrodes inside the heart. So if somebody, lots of times they will provoke VTAC or polymorph VTAC and then just shock them out of it. It's not a big deal for them. Um, but that'll confirm the diagnosis of Brugada also. And, and if the patient does have evidence of Brugada syndrome, then what they do is they'll give them the treatment of choice, which is placement of an AICD. That's the only proven effective therapy for this syndrome. So they get an AICD and then they go on and hopefully live a, a happy normal life, which is what happened in this case. Here's another case. This is a patient that came to the emergency department that I and my colleagues took care of. When the patient arrived in the emergency department, the patient was in cardiac arrest. We got the patient back, return of spontaneous circulation, and um, we looked up in some records and we found this EKG from a primary care doctor's office. The EKG was obtained in the primary care doctor's office after the patient presented with syncope. And it was read by the machine as incomplete right bundle, that's it. Well, when you look at this, you'll notice that there is, yeah, there's an incomplete right bundle, but ST elevation is not normal for an incomplete right bundle. A little bit of ST elevation of V1 and V2, your money leads terminating in an inverted T wave that's very typical also, and it was missed. Now, I would never say that this is standard of care for a primary care doc to know about this, but you can just imagine if they had known about this a week earlier when the patient visited them, the, the outcome could have been very, very different. And unfortunately, even though we got this patient back, the patient ended up with severe hypoxic encephalopathy, and last I heard, lives in one of the nursing homes in Baltimore with the peg and a trach and not much of a mental status, all right? Here's another one. Take a look at this. This is a bit more subtle, and you see that incomplete right bundle pattern with a little bit of elevation. This was picked up by the emergency physician and sent to the EP lab, and they confirmed the presence of Brigada. This is definitely more subtle, but again, incomplete right bundle with ST elevation is not normal, terminating in an inverted T wave. For comparison, this is what a normal right bundle looks like. Right? Normally with the right bundle or an incomplete right bundle, you'll have a little bit of ST depression in V1 and V2. So if you ever see an incomplete or a complete right bundle with ST segment elevation in V1 or V2, especially in the right clinical scenario, they came in because of syncope or near syncope, you've got to think about Brigada syndrome and get on the phone with the electrophysiologist. And this is another case where just by knowing about this diagnosis, you might just end up saving life. Here's another example. This is subtle again, but there's an incomplete right bundle with ST elevation terminating in an inverted T wave. There's that saddle morphology in V2, and this turned out to be positive for Brigada syndrome. Here's another one. This, this is kind of limited to V1, but a very classic morphology in V1. This is a young person that was having intermittent near syncopal episodes, and Dr. Shepard here made the diagnosis. Here's another very classic looking V1 and V2. Again, incomplete right bundle with that convex upwards ST elevation. Send that patient to an electrophysiologist and you're gonna save a life. And here's yet another example. This patient was actually diagnosed at a community hospital and you see this, uh, the patient went there because of a syncopal episode. V2 is a little bit unusual looking, but again, V1 is very classic for that Brigada pattern. The patient was transferred over to university to the electrophysiologist, and the electrophysiologist looked at the EKG and said, yep, this is Brigada until proven otherwise. They took the patient to the EP lab and proved that it was Brigada. The patient got a box, AICD, and ended up doing okay. This EKG actually was overread by a general cardiologist the next day as, uh, well, as um, just ST elevation, possible MI. The general cardiologist did not know about Brigada syndrome. The electrophysiologist took one look at this and said, this is Brigada, until proven otherwise. So again, I, I bring that up just to highlight the fact that there's a very different level of knowledge between your electrophysiologist and the other types of, of cardiologists out there, all right? So if you have an option, try to get on the phone with the electrophysiologist. Here's another very classic example in, in V1. Now, this was originally described by the Brigada brothers uh, back in the late 80s, 
and, and some other Italians had described it around the same time also. It was originally described in Southeast Asian adolescent males. That's what, where they first studied it in Southeast Asia, but I'm not harping on that because it's now been identified in every ethnic group, men and women. The youngest age it's been identified that I've heard of is in infants, and there's actually some people that believe that this may be a contributing factor uh, to SIDS, and the oldest patients I've heard about are all the way up to 75 or 80 years old, and the oldest person in whom I have an EKG case is a 65-year-old. So even though this was first identified in you know, teenage boys in Southeast Asia, it's everywhere. Um, and, uh, and they estimate that Brugada may be responsible for about four to five percent of all medically related cardiac arrests. Put trauma aside, think about that. One out of every 20 to 25 cardiac arrests may be attributable to Brugada syndrome. This is not as rare as you may think, all right? So if you have, in your career, if you've seen 20 to 25 Brugada cases, Statistically, you've probably, or I'm sorry, if you've seen one out, if you've seen 20 to 25 cardiac arrests in your career, which is probably everybody here, uh, statistically, you've seen Brigada, all right? The computer will often miss this. The computer will look at this and call this an acute MI. I've never seen computers accurately diagnose this. Sometimes they overcall it or undercall it. If the patient comes in with syncope and you see this, then you've got to think about Brigada, which is what this was. Now, on the other hand, if you see this pattern and the patient comes in with chest pain, yeah, if, if they're coming in with chest pain, I'm going to call this an acute septal STEMI. So the history makes a difference. If somebody comes in with syncope or near syncope or palpitations, uh, I'm going to worry about Brigada. But if somebody's coming in with substernal chest pressure and you see ST elevation, then of course you're going to call it a STEMI. All right? Okay. So what are you looking for with Brigada? We're looking for a right bundle or an incomplete right bundle-ish looking pattern in V1 and V2 with ST elevation. If it's convex upwards, that's the most concerning, or straight terminating in an inverted T wave, that's the most concerning. If it's, if it's concave upwards, that turns out to be less sensitive and less specific. But if you've got a concerning history, I would run with that and get on the phone with electrophysiologists either way. All right, another mental break here. This is actually a restaurant in Nashville where somebody sent me uh, a sign of a restaurant called Brigada. I don't know if people go in there and collapse. I'm not really sure. But, okay, so mental break. Let's recap. When you get an EKG on people who have just had syncope, what are you looking for? Well, everyone knows to look for ischemia and arrhythmia as navy blocks. We've added hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to the list, and we've added Brigada to the list of things that you always look for. All right, what else? What else can you be looking for? Well, how about this? Here's a 26-year-old nurse that I was working with one day in the emergency department. Healthy guy, he plays basketball regularly. He's not overweight, he's no cardiac risk factors. And he was popping these tums over and over. He thought he was having reflux. I said, what's going on? He said, I'm, I'm having palpitations. I think it's just reflux. So I said, well, why don't we get it an EKG? And we got an EKG during one of these episodes and this was his EKG, all right? He's got an irregularly irregular uh, QRS pattern. Some complexes are narrow, some are wide, and I'm seeing some people are nailing the diagnosis. This is atrial fibrillation with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. This is another one of those diagnoses that you've got to know. Now, if you see the patient come in with this rhythm, then it, it becomes kind of easy. Usually they're going to come in in normal sinus rhythm. Uh, so let's talk briefly about WPW syndrome. And for those people that are, are uh, going to do the EKG workshop, we're going to go into this in a lot more detail. But right now, we'll just cover the basics of WPW. Remember what the classic triad is for WPW syndrome. It's a short PR, a wide QRS, slightly wide QRS, and then the delta wave, that slurring of the upstroke at the beginning. Essentially, you've got your P wave and then there's not much of a PR interval. Your P wave, and then bam, it goes right into the QRS. And the initial upslope of the QRS is very inefficient, and so it's slurred. And then you'll notice that the back half of the QRS is very nice and normal because the back half of ventricular repol or, uh, depolarization is very efficient, but the initiation of depolarization is inefficient, so you get a slurring of the upstroke. It's not rare, 0.1 to 0.3% of the population, so all of us will see it. 
uh, a few times a year probably. And this is what you're looking for in the post syncope patient. You're looking for somebody with the short PR, the delta wave. There's a nice one, short PR, delta wave. Notice, however, that the short PR and the delta wave are not present in all of the leads. And a lot of people just learn to look for delta waves. You know, if you look at the mid portion of this EKG, you're going to miss it because the delta waves are present in only a few leads. I've, I've seen some cases of WPW where good delta waves are present in only one or two leads. And if you're not looking everywhere carefully, you're gonna miss it. So what I tell people is, if you wanna never miss WPW, don't get in the habit of only looking for del delta waves. What you do is every time you read an EKG, look at the intervals, the PR, the QRS, and the QT. If you always do that, when you look at the PR and you see a short PR, less than 120 milliseconds, whenever you see a short PR in somebody who had syncope, now that's your trigger to go looking everywhere for delta waves and then you'll pick it up in sometimes just one or two leads. But if you're just trained or programmed to only look for delta waves, you'll miss it. But as long as you're looking at the PRs, your short PR will tip you off to go looking everywhere for delta waves and then you'll pick it up, all right? So this, if, if you just glance at this, you're gonna miss WPW, but when you look at this, and you go through your stepwise approach to reading KGs, rate, rhythm, intervals, stop, look for the PR, and when the PR is short, now you look everywhere, and ah, there's the delta wave in lead two, and V5, and, and V6, and so on. All right, why do we worry about WPW? Well, WPW patients are predisposed to have SVTs. Usually that's not a problem, and they get treated pretty easily, but WPW can also predispose to have AFib, and AFib is the killer because what you end up with is irregularly irregular and you can get enormously rapid rates, sometimes 250, 300 beats per minute. And patients often can't tolerate that for long. Eventually they're gonna go down to the ground called syncope and they may not come back. So you've gotta pick up WPW when they are in this state before they end up going into this. If you discharge them with this, because you missed it, next time they go out, they may go into the AFib and have a malignant, have a, a terrible outcome. So the key things here, WPW with AFib is irregularly regular. Morphologies vary. Some QRSs are wide, some are narrow, and it can get extremely rapid. What's happening here is that you've got, remember, think about what atrial fibrillation is. You've got four, five, 600 impulses or foci in the atrium that are all firing impulses down. Some are coming through the AV node. Usually the AV node will let about 150, plus or minus a little bit, 150 per minute through. And because they're utilizing his perkinji, you get narrow QRS complexes. The AV node also, if it sees too many impulses, it just squashes them. It'll only wants to see about 150, it'll only let about 150 through. All the rest of them, it just kills them. So that's a really useful function of the AV node. And then a lot of the impulses go down the accessory pathway, which has no AV node, so it's all too happy to conduct everything. And when it con conducts down the accessory pathway, you get myocyte to myocyte conduction rather than efficient Hisperkinji conduction, you get inefficient myocyte to myocyte conduction, so you get wide complexes. So impulses going down the AV node are narrow, impulses coming down the accessory pathway are wide, so you'll see some narrow complexes, some wide complexes, some fusions between the two, and because the accessory pathway has no AV node, it'll conduct everything. It'll conduct at rates of 250, 300, 400 beats per minute if necessary. So the AV node only conducts about 150 per minute and it squashes all the rest of them, all right? So the resulting rhythm is irregularly irregular with morphologies that are changing, narrow, wide infusions, and rates might be 200, 250 or so, all right? Once again, take a look at this. Irregularly irregular, morphology is changing, and in some places, rates 250, 300 beats per minute. Normal AFib never goes that fast, unless you have an accessory pathway, all right? Irregularly irregular, morphology is changing, some narrow, some wide, and in some places, the rates can get really, really fast because that accessory pathway is all too happy to conduct everything that you see. Now, what happens if you give the patient an AV nodal blocker, all right? Supposing you're not thinking about WPW, supposing you're just thinking about AFib with a bundle, and you say, yeah, let's give them some AV nodal blocker, let's give some calcium channel blocker, diltiazem, or a beta blocker, 
or a DIG or amiodarone, which is an AV nodal blocker. Well, this patient got, AV, got some amiodarone, which is an AV nodal blocker. Take a look what happens. It's a very reliable kill. Some might call it a clean kill, right? If you give these patients any AV nodal blockers, the adenosine, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, DIG, amiodarone, you can induce and often will induce uh, ventricular fibrillation. Why would that be? Well, think about what your AV nodal blocker does. It takes out the AV node. It blocks at the AV node. Now, what was our AV node doing? Our AV node was conducting some impulses, but it was, <clears throat> it was squashing a whole bunch of others, right? So if you, if you block the AV node, where do those five or 600 impulses decide to go? They all just go down the accessory pathway. So now, which is all too happy to conduct everything. So now instead of a rate of 250 or 300 beats per minute, now you've got a rate of five or 600 beats per minute, and that's called V-fib. And you're called defendant, <laughs> right? So you cannot use AV nodal blockers with these patients. If you see a patient with AFib WPW, probably the best thing to do for them is to just shock them, or you can use procainamide, but no calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, adenosine ditch, no amiodarone either. All right, take a look at this. This is AFib with the right bundle. There's no accessory pathway here. So you could give this patient any drug you want. Give them calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, because there's no accessory pathway. How do I know there's no accessory pathway here? Very simple, because the morphologies of the QRS complexes are pretty much all the same all the way across. If there were an accessory pathway conducting, the morphologies would have to be changing. You'd have some narrow, some wide, some fusions. The morphologies are all the same. So I know there's no accessory pathway. Here's another one. Take a look at this. I know there's no accessory pathway here either. How do I know? Because the morphologies are staying the same. If there's an accessory pathway, the morphologies have to be changing and it would probably be a lot more rapid. So this patient has no accessory pathway. I'm gonna give him anything I want. I'm gonna give him diltiazem or, or beta blockers, whatever. It doesn't matter, all right? So the key thing here is AFib WPW, it's irregularly irregular, and the morphologies are changing appearance. If the morphologies stay the same all the way across, you can be pretty sure it's not an accessory pathway that's conducting anything, all right? So again, WPW is one of the things that you always look for. Check the PR intervals. Don't just look for delta waves. Check the PR interval, and every time you see a short PR, then go searching in all 12 leads for deltas and that's when you'll pick up WPW, all right? Okay, so let's take another mental break here. Let's go back to the beginning. When you get an EKG in a post syncope patient, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for arrhythmias, you're looking for ischemia, you're also looking for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're looking for Brigada, and you're looking for WPW, all right? Anything else? Well, let's add one more thing, all right? And this one, this is one that your computer usually will pick up but you've got to know the significance of it. Here's a 40-year-old woman who comes in after having some type of spell. You know, she fell to the ground, she shook a little bit. What, whenever bystanders are there and they see a person fall to the ground and shake, what do they say? Or exactly, they say it's a seizure. What do they tell the paramedics? Paramedics arrive and they tell the paramedics, oh, she had a seizure. Paramedics show up in the emergency department and they say, we're bringing this patient here for a first time seizure. You always check an EKG on anyone with a first-time seizure. And the reason is that sometimes the so-called seizure is not actually a brain problem. Sometimes it's actually a heart problem, which made them have syncope and fall. Sometimes people with syncope fall to the ground and shake for 5, 10, 15 seconds or so. That's not a seizure. That's just some myoclonic jerks that are associated with syncope. You know, I remember the neurologist used to always teach, not everything that falls and shakes is a seizure. Right? Uh, sometimes syncope will fall to the ground and shake a little bit. So you check an EKG, and when you look at this EKG, I think hopefully most everybody can see that this patient has a, a very prolonged QT interval. You especially see it out there in V2. Very prolonged QT interval. Prolonged QT, why do we worry about prolonged QT in the first place? Well, prolonged QT can lead to torsad. Well, next question then, of course, how, you know, how long is too long for the, the prolonged QT? Uh, well, when you use the Bazette formula, which is not perfect, but it's the most commonly used formula, it's probably what your computer uses. 
when the QTC, the corrected QT, is over 500, that is when you start worrying about the market increase risk for torsad. And the higher that QTC goes, the more at risk the patient is for developing torsad. So I really worry when I see the QTC, the corrected QT, the QTC over 500. If the QTC's 470, 480, yeah, your computer might call it prolonged, but I don't worry too much about it until that QTC is over 500. And then when I see the QTC is over 500, then I start looking for the underlying cause. Is it hypo-K, hypo-mag, hypocalcemia, drugs? You know, what's the underlying cause? But that's when the patients are at risk for torsade. Here's a nice case. Um, this was, uh, it was probably about 10 minutes before the end of my shift. I was doing a 3 to 11 shift, and I'm, I'm cleaning things up, and I think, you know, for once I'm going to get out on time. Uh, maybe 11.30 right after sign out. Usually I'm there till at least 12 or 12.30 or so trying to clean up loose ends. And I was really on top of stuff, so I thought, you know, I'm going to be able to get out right after sign out. And then they come and drop the chart right in the rack in front of me. And I'm thinking, ugh, you know, do I really need to see this patient? Well, it turned out that this was a psychiatry patient who had recently started having uh, who had recently started some new medications, and the triage note had a little bit of a red flag. It said, patient is somnolent and suicidal. Uh, no big deal. And then it said, patient is faking syncope. So I thought, you know, that's a little bit unusual. Well, we probably ought to get an EKG since this patient's on some psych meds. So I said to the EKG tech, do you think you can get me an EKG? Um, take your time, take at least 10 minutes, no rush. So honestly, he comes back in two minutes and he shows me the EKG, here it is, so you're looking at it. And there's the EKG, he says, Dr. Batu, I've got an EKG. And I'm thinking, ugh, you know, look at this EKG, it kind of looks like there's a prolonged QT in there and she's on psych meds. But you know what, there's some artifact in there also. So it's like five minutes before the end of my shift. So I say to the tech, you know what, do you think you could get, there's some artifact here, do you think you can get me a better baseline? Take your time, take at least 10 or 15 minutes. He comes back two minutes later and says, Dr. Matu, I've got a better baseline EKG for you. Here it is. So I'm thinking, oh my God, she's going in and out of torsade. So I said to, I actually said to the tech, what was she doing when you got this EKG? He said, she was faking syncope. No, she wasn't faking syncope. She was trying to die. She, she was on these new psych meds that prolonged the QT and she was going in and out of torsade and that was producing these intermittent episodes of syncope and we happened to capture it on one of these EKGs, in and out of torsade. So that's really, again, what you worry about. So thank God I, I got the EKG because if I had cleared her and sent her off to psych and she had a cardiac arrest back there, that would have been a real disaster. But this was related to her medications. There's a lot of different things that can prolong the QT and set off torsade. Um, here's a 51-year-old who came in with uh, acute gastroenteritis. She was severely hypo-K and hypo-mag from multiple episodes of vomiting and diarrhea. And when you look at her 12 lead, you can see a very prolonged QT up there. You know, you wouldn't normally think that a gastroenteritis patient is going to potentially die, but on the monitor, she went into torsade from severe hypo-K. So I've really learned to respect bad gastroenteritis. I've really learned to respect severe dehydration. And any patient who's at high risk for electrolyte abnormalities, I get an EKG on those patients early. Here's an alcoholic who visits us probably every Friday and Saturday. Friday, usually he's intoxicated. Saturday, he's usually withdrawing. On this particular day, he came in with alcohol withdrawal. He was retching, vomiting. He looked really dehydrated. And so I thought, well, he looks really bad. He's at high risk for electrolyte problems. Let's get an EKG on him early, and uh, here's the EKG. Now, it turns out these T-wave inversions are old, but what's new is this very prolonged QT. So instead of putting him in the hallway where we normally put the alcoholics when beds are filled, just to get fluids and, and some thiamine and magnesium and everything else, we, we put him on a monitor because his QT is long. He's at high risk. And while he was on the cardiac monitor, he started going in and out of torsade. So instead of just dripping in the magnesium, we started pushing it in, and it turned out he was hypo-K and hypo-mag also, which is typical for alcoholics, and, uh, and then his uh, ectopy went away. But he, very, he could very easily have died laying in the stretcher in the hallway if we hadn't gotten that EKG right up front. Here's an interesting case. This is a 39-year-old guy who got brought in 
for presumed first-time seizure. And what do we say earlier? If, if you look up in any review article or any textbook chapter, the workup for first-time seizure always includes check an EKG. If you ever wondered why you need to check an EKG, it's for this reason, because sometimes people that are thought to have seizures from the brain are actually having just myoclonic jerks and seizures because of a heart problem. They're having arrhythmias. If you have an arrhythmia that hyperperfuses the brain, you're going to fall to the ground and you might shake a little bit and everyone's going to think it's a seizure and it's not a seizure. It's not a brain problem. They don't need phenytoin or Levetiracetam or valproic acid. No, what they need is an EKG to figure out what caused the syncope. And if you look up here, this patient got brought in because of first time seizure. We got an EKG and this patient has a prolonged QT of 563. So we put him on a monitor and while he was there being monitored, he had another seizure and it was preceded by a run of torsad. He was having torsad that was hyperperfusing the brain. He'd fall to the ground, shake a little bit. Everyone thought it was a seizure. He doesn't need any problem or any meds for his brain. He needs something to, he needs some evaluation to reverse the prolonged QT, all right? So again, one of the things you've got to look for is the prolonged QT. When do you worry about it? You worry about it when the QT is too, is too long, over 500, the QTC. And what should you do? Check the electrolytes, take a look at their medication list, and stay away from any QT prolonging medications. All right. All right, well, let's, uh, let's sum up what we've talked about. What is it that you're looking for on the EKG of a patient who comes in after a syncopal episode? Everyone knows, these top two are the no-brainers. Everyone knows to look for cardiac ischemia and to look for dysrhythmias. What else did we add to the list? High voltage with deep narrow Q waves, send them for a Doppler echo to look for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. V1 and V2, if they show an incomplete right bundle type of pattern with that coved ST elevation terminating in an inverted T wave, send them to an electrophysiologist to look for Brigada syndrome. Make sure to look at the PR interval, and anytime the PR is short, think about WPW. Look for those delta waves everywhere, and also pay attention to the prolonged QT. If the QT is over 500 milliseconds, then start looking for the underlying cause of potential prolonged QT. Hypo K, hypo mag, hypocalcemia. There's a lot of medications in, that can do it as well. Those are the things that you've really got to look for. With that, I will conclude. If you have any questions, uh, please just shoot me an email at amelmatu at comcast.net. And thank you all for your attention.